Hello, everyone. We're going to give folks a minute to join. I see the participant count ticking up, but we will be beginning shortly. Kind of like microwave popcorn when you're waiting for those last few pops to happen and you're listening. I'm doing that with the participants. Like, how many more kernels can we get if we just let it pop? No. Oh. Hello, Toronto. All righty, we'll just get started with some uh, housekeeping. Hi, I'm Allie Brown. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at ASCP. And welcome back to our bridging, Building Bridges Across the Laboratory Community webinar series. As a reminder, our series here is being launched in collaboration with CDC as part of the One Lab Initiative. So check out CDC's One Lab Initiative. Uh, we're at the end of our series currently as it stands, and we hope that the case studies that we've presented here have sparked your interest on how we as the laboratory community can continue to build bridges across various aspects of our diverse community to help tackle public health emergency responses and lab workforce challenges that we're all experiencing throughout our industry. Get my mute on off there. Thanks, Dr. Brown. I'm Dr. Rodney Rohde. I am part of the ASCP Blueprint for Action Workforce, and I'm also a chair and professor at Texas State University. And I want to uh, welcome you to this fourth session of the Building Bridges Across the Laboratory Community uh, Series. Uh, we're excited to be joined today by Dr. Suzanne Dell, who is Discipline Director for LabCorp. And she will share a case study on how the LabCorp team worked closely with the CDC and the FDA to validate and scale high throughput testing platforms, which we all know has been critical both during COVID and the NPOX outbreak. And they did that in response to the NPOX uh, outbreak in the summer of 2022. So we want to welcome Dr. Dale to share her experience collaborating with the CDC and the FDA to validate and to do that scaling up and to share her insights uh, from the laboratory data generated from offering that testing nationally. And I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brown again to give some more housekeeping notes for us. You bet. So we all probably know lines are muted. Uh, so if you have a question, please feel free to drop that question in the Q&A chat box. And Rodney and I will address them as they come up when we have uh, time within the presentation to address those questions. Also, closed captioning is available for any interested parties for this webinar. And finally, the presentation slides, a short summary of the case being presented and the recorded session are all gonna be available in about two to three weeks. So look out for those. Finally, we'd like to acknowledge that this resource was made possible from the CDC. However, ASCP is solely responsible for the content and viewpoints shared today, and they don't necessarily represent those of CDC. So with that, um, Dr. Dale, we'd love to hear you introduce yourself, and then we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, and I am excited to be here to share uh, the LabCorp experience with offering uh, MPOX testing um, across the country. And it's, it's almost hard to believe um, that it's been um, nearly a year since we, or actually just over a year since we embarked on this journey. Um, so as was mentioned, um, I'm an employee of LabCorp. I'm located in the Burlington Laboratory, which is one of our um, main uh, laboratories. We do a lot of routine testing, testing, but some esoteric testing as well. So um, when it came to responding to MPOX, um, it was in the Burlington Laboratory that we um, initially launched uh, testing. So i um, really excited to kind of share, share the story with everyone. And I hope you can all see my slides, um, the, the appropriate view. Um, if not, someone will let me know, but I'm going to head right into the presentation. 
So we'll start with a little bit of background um, about MPOX. Um, and certainly it, it has been um, in, in the news uh, recently uh, due to the recent 2022 outbreak. Um, but MPOX um, it, it is actually um, a virus um, that um, we've recognized for really over 50 years at this point. And it's uh, classified as an orthopox vi vi virus uh, belonging uh, in the family of the pox vir viridae. And these are viruses that are, that are very large. Um, you can actually observe them under, under a microscope. Um, and they're, they're characterized by the fact that they're brick shaped and they have um, relatively large double stranded DNA genomes. Um, the viruses belonging to this family are very stable um, and they can um, live on fomites um, for prolonged periods of time. And this actually helps us in the lab to be able to accept um, a large variety of specimens. Um, we know that they are relatively stable and we can, um, you know, usually get a quality amount of a D DNA out of them. Um, prior to the 2022 outbreak, MPOX was really classified into to two clades. And um, the, the clades uh, were determined based on uh, where they, they were generally found. Um, clade one is also known as the Congo ba Basin clade. Um, and it was mostly clustered in uh, the Cameroon, uh, uh, from uh, the Cameroon uh, area of Af Af Africa um, through to the Congo. And clade one infections are typically more severe with case fatalities ranging um, above 10%. Um, when the current MPOX outbreak occurred, um, what we were seeing is that uh, this outbreak was related, but a little bit divergent from clade two. Um, and clade two infections were typically thought to uh, be more mild in nature. Um, but this virus that we're seeing in the 2022 MPOX outbreak is a little bit different and it led to the description of a third clade of MPOX called clade three. So the phylogenetics of um, the of the orthopox uh, group or family um, is, is shown here on the left-hand side of this slide. And um, you can see uh, MPOX, um, which is listed here under its old name of monkeypox, is rather closely related to cowpox and vaccinia. And vaccinia is really material that is used in vaccines. Um, we also use it in the laboratory as a control material. Um, but monkeypox or mpox um, is also related to smallpox, uh, the variola, variola ma 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 major. Um, and um, I think you can see some similarities in the clinical presentation of mpox. And when, when I say that, it's, it's not nearly as, um, as uh, so severe, however, uh, you do see a large distribution of lesions on patients with MPOX as you would in patients with smallpox. Um, and on the right-hand um, side of this slide, um, this is from a publication uh, that uh, was published in September 2022 when it was realized that um, the 2022 outbreak was really associated um, with a new distinct um, uh, clade called clade three, um, which um, these viruses in clade three tend to have polymorphisms within them um, that facilitate human to human transmission. And I apologize, my light goes out if I don't move enough in my office. So um, if you see me waving my hand, I'm just turning the light back on. So um, the clinical features and transmission of MPOX, um, I'll just go through um, these briefly. The incubation period is usually one to two weeks, but can range anywhere from five to 21 days. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, the symptoms are similar to smallpox, but milder. 
and generally begin with fever, headache, a muscle ache, malaise, and specifically MPOX is really characterized by swollen lymph nodes. Um, within one to three days of the onset of sort of the constitutional sym symptoms, um, the rash begins to appear. And the rash um, is a progressive rash that will actually progress through stages listed here. And, and ultimately, um, the, the rash will, will scab over. Um, and, and this um, can take really um, two to four weeks in any given patient. And really it's um, the fact that patients are infectious and you can find virus in these lesions until they have completely healed. Um, in the early stages of MPOX, the rash may be mistaken for um, common infections that we see in the population. So HSV, VZV, or se se secondary sy syphilis. Um, the uh, transmission of monkeypox can uh, occur from human to human, from animal to human, or via fomites or uh, contact with the virus um, on an inanimate object. And, and respiratory tr transmission has been documented, um, but it generally is not a great virus that transmits via the respiratory route. It generally requires prolonged face-to-face -face contact. So in the spring, the late spring and early uh, su summer of 2022, we really saw um, a, a global sort of outbreak or resurgence of NPOX. And, and prior to that time, cases outside of a a a Africa were rarely reported. And, and when they were reported outside of um, that location, they were usually associated or could be traced back to travel. However, in May of 2022, um, there was a, a case that was recognized in a returning traveler um, from Nigeria, and this was reported on May 7th. Um, but what was concerning is that about a week later, there were um, an, an additional two case reports of patients um, who had MPOX without history of travel. Um, so this, this represented really in-country spread of MPOX in the UK. And then subsequently, um, on May 16th, there were four additional patients. Um, and these were in patients who identified as gay, uh, bisexual, se or men who have sex with men. Um, and then in subsequent weeks, we saw a spread of cases to other countries in Europe, as well as the United States and South America, as well as Canada. And in July of 2022, um, the WHO um, declared this um, a PE, PHEIC and public health emergency of I I international concern. Um, and um, that really sort of um, ushered in um, really kind of what I, I will call sort of a, a, a summer of um, recognizing um, additional cases. Um, not only within the United States, where we see the burden of infection um, is, was actually quite quite high overall, um, as shown on the graph on the on the right, um, but across Europe and South America as well. Um, and and these are these are graphs from um, March of 2023, so the case numbers are a little bit different at this point, um, but the distribution remains uh, much the same. So if we look at the 2022 MPOX outbreak in relation to previous outbreaks of this infection, um, a couple of things are, are notable. In um, the 2022 outbreak, the incubation period appeared to be a little bit shorter than previous outbreaks. So um, six to seven days um, versus almost two weeks in previous outbreaks. Um, this, this may actually represent uh, the fact that the virus is a little bit better at transmitting from human to human. Um, we have seen and continue to see the overwhelming preponderance of cases in males um, and very few cases in females, which is very different than previous outbreaks. Um, and 
in in addition, um, in previous outbreaks, uh, we saw certainly more hospital admissions than we're seeing now, although there's still a significant morbidity and mortality associated with the 2022 MPOX outbreak. Um, but um, like past outbreaks um, for clade two specifically, the fatality rate is actually very low. And um, one of the other um, important things to note is that um, the, the 2022 outbreak um, is really impacting um, patients who may be diagnosed with HIV. Um, and we see that in our, our lab core data, we've actually looked at co-infection rates of HIV as well as other STIs. And there's a significant preponderance of MPOX infection in uh, groups that have either HIV or other STIs. Um, and, and this was um, something that was uh, new and not previously appreciated in past outbreaks. Um, wasn't really, really looked at. I mean, this, this clearly has been the largest MPOX outbreak that the globe has ever experienced. So really has opened up opportunities for a lot of research um, into how this virus can spread and what populations it impacts. So um, in, the, in the United States, um, the first case uh, was reported in Massachusetts um, in May of 2022. And this was a patient who had been returning from travel and had a rash um, that appeared three days after his return. Um, swabs were collected and they were positive um, in Massachusetts for an assay that targets orthopox DNA. Um, that's the, the samples were sent to the C CDC and by May 18th, um, there was confirmation of the presence of uh, clade two of MPOX. Um, almost concomitantly to the Massachusetts case, there was a returning traveler from New York City who presented with lesions and a rash and um, was tested at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and they um, were able to report a positive result from the Orthopox uh, DNA test as well. And so the, the testing for MPOX or Orthopox, um, the family for which MPOX belongs to, has been performed in laboratories um, across the United States that make up the laboratory response network. Um, so this test um, was always available and um, really allowed the United States to very rapidly identify um, the cause of um, the rash in, in these patients. So let's, let's dig in a little bit onto the uh, C CDC non variola orthopox um, test, which I'll abbreviate as NBO. Um, this is a method using uh, the PCR based chemistry, which detects the E9L um, gene of orthopox. It will, it's, it's not exclusive for MPOX, um, so it will detect MPOX as well as other members of the NBO family, such as cowpox. Camelpox, Ectromelia, et cetera. Now this test first received a 510K uh, in the United States from FDA in 2005. And it has um, been updated um, again in 2018 um, to reflect an update to labeling and use of reagents. And um, prior to the 2022 MPOX outbreak, this test was really restricted to laboratories within the Laboratory Response Network, or LRN. And at the beginning of the 2022 MPOX outbreak, there was actually a significant amount of LRN laboratory um, test availability and capacity, um, which was great. Um, if you think back to, to COVID, we were all starting from, from ground zero. Um, <clears throat> this was very different in that these, this test was already up and running um, and was being performed uh, across more than 60 laboratories in the United States. And this was really shown nicely in, in a publication in July of uh, 2022, 
where it was estimated that the LRN capacity um, was 8,000 tests per week for the NVO assay. And um, initial capacity limitations were really due to reagents. So obviously, um, I don't think anyone expected that you would need the number of primers and probes um, to scale um, at that level, but that was an initial bottleneck, um, as well as the requirement to manually extract um, the DNA. Um, and in response, uh, the uh, L LRN labs um, worked very quickly to bring on additional labs within their network, and they imp implemented some operational changes, for example, um, bringing on extra shifts, extra personnel, and really shifting testing priorities. Um, so you can see in the table reflected on this slide um, that very quickly testing was ramped up in the LRN laboratories. And so between the identification of that first case um, on May, in sort of the middle of May um, to, to the end of June, um, they were able to test hundreds and hundreds of specimens. And I think what is pretty remarkable um, is that the positivity rate was extremely high across all of these weeks of testing. Um, and I mean, certainly um, one of the, the important things that, that we consider when we talk about really access to testing, it's not just having the test available, but it's also how quickly can you turn around that result? And um, there was really excellent turnaround time from the LRN laboratories um, in that most positive cases were reported uh, within about a day and a half. So really excellent, excellent performance. Um, so the, the assay itself, as I mentioned, is based on TACMAN chemistry, detecting the E9L gene uh, that's conserved uh, across the or orthopox fa family. Um, and, and the gene we actually detect is abbreviated um, VAC within the laboratory. So if you hear me talk about VAC, that's really the target of the NBO assay. Um, the test itself incorporates a specimen control, a collection control called human RNAs P. Um, this is a common collection control that um, is also used in many COVID tests. And the assay itself has four potential outputs. So um, if, a, if you have a VAC result that is detected with a CT value less than 37, that is a positive result. And the interpretation is really a presumptive positive. Um, and this is the labeling within the 510K um, test, um, test insert. Um, a negative result um, requires that you detect the RNA's P gene at a CT value less than 40, um, and you don't detect uh, the VAC1. And, and then there are two other results um, equivocal and inconclusive, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation about the differences with those results. But basically those um, results are lack of detection of uh, the VAC1 gene to a level that we would expect um, with or without concomitant detection of the RNA's P gene. And those two categories were actually very confusing when we launched our assay. So I'll, I'll save that for a little bit later. So um, in 2022, uh, in, in June, um, we received a call from the CDC and the FDA. And, and basically we were asked, we were one of five commercial laboratories in the United States that were asked, would we consider expanding um, the use of the NVO assay? And would we help to scale it such that, um, we could offer more than more testing uh, across the, the US. And so our, our overall goal in this partnership was really to increase our testing uh, amounts to greater than 10,000 samples per week per laboratory. So there were five commercial laboratories that were approached to do this. So this would have ultimately resulted in capacity of the commercial labs to offer 50,000 tests per week on top of the 8,000 tests per week, which were already being performed in the LRN. 
And to do this, it really required the establishment of higher throughput protocols um, and really a modification of the currently 510K um, approved NVOSA. And so um, we, of course, said yes, as did some of our colleagues um, at some other reference laboratories. And each laboratory was really tasked with generating validation data to support increasing testing capacity for MPOX across the country. And we, we did this in a very rapid fashion. Um, so this, this plan started in mid-June. We had weekly calls um, to report on progress of the validation work that we were doing. Um, and then ultimately throughout um, the next few weeks, um, our laboratories were able to mobilize and launch testing. Um, we were able to incorporate assay modifications to scale the test uh, through enforcement discretion letters um, that were sent to FDA that were sent by FDA to the CDC. And I'll share a little bit more about what those look like um, as, as we go along in the presentation. Um, but this was really, I, I can't sort of emphasize enough. This was this was a collaboration um, in terms of sharing protocols. Um, SOPs, best practices across the five labs that were tasked with doing the scaling, as well as FDA and the CDC. So I'll give you an overview of the original NVO assay workflow. Um, it basically required a swab of a lesion and the, the preference for swab um, was a dry swab. So we would receive a dry swab within the laboratory we would have to elute the lesion material from that swab in a buffer, extract the DNA, and um, the extraction platform uh, was a chiogen um, extractor. And then uh, PCR for um, VAC1 was performed on an ABI, uh, 7500DX, and then results were reported. So this is the original NVO assay workflow and we were we had a few bottlenecks um, within this workflow that I will I will talk about how we addressed. So so how did we get to um, maybe being asked to participate in scaling of the NVO assay? Um, you know we we had worked with um, folks in public health as part of our COVID responses. So so we we knew the people uh, we knew the we knew the right players, um, and and we really knew that we needed for the MVO assay because this is something that we had not performed in our laboratories before. Really close coordination between the CDC and the LRN labs and our commercial labs to train staff on performing the assay, and so we were very fortunate um, very early on in the process that. Real world experience was shared with us um, from New York State Department of Health, uh, Wadsworth. Um, we were able to participate in sessions um, over the internet um, regarding uh, training on the performance of the assay, um, as well as um, how to safely work with the specimens, um, and as well as well how to ensure that staff were competent and trained appropriately on the assay performance. And so some of those, those items were obviously uh, appropriate PPE. Um, we had to use slightly higher levels of PPE than um, maybe what folks in my laboratory had been accustomed to. Um, we certainly um, work in BSCs, but it was nice to have a refresher on sort of how to set up the, the cabinets, um, because when I talk about the processing, I think you'll see that it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, and really, you know, how do we document that we have um, appropriately trained um, staff on the assay, um, as well as ongoing competency for our regulatory requirements? Um, once we had completed this training, we set to work with our verification work um, and then submitted documentations of our studies to the CDC um, such that we could work with FDA to get enforcement discretion of some of the modi modifications that we had been making. 
So we launched testing at LabCorp on July 6, 2022. So that is, if, if you remember on my previous slide, um, we actually started this kind of in mid-June. And so three to four weeks later, we, um, we actually launched testing, which was remarkable. So expanding our lab capacity. So um, again, we have a long history of working with uh, public health labs and the CDC and the FDA in response um, to emerging pathogens. And, and that was, was um, certainly, um, certainly accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we had infrastructure in place to mobilize quickly to support MPOX testing by repurposing some of the um, test equipment that we had um, procured for COVID-19. Um, and, you know, we also had experience scaling daily testing capacity. So if I go back to the COVID example again, um, when we launched our testing for COVID at LabCorp, our throughput um, was, was very minimal compared to what we ended up with. Um, and we were working very quickly in the spring of uh, 2020 to, to scale testing. So um, we sort of had the playbook already in place. And um, we also knew the CDC folks, the FDA folks, and obviously our colleagues and other commercial labs so that we could rapidly um, on our weekly calls uh, bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and, and I think one of the, the most, um, the most uh, important things that, that we can offer as a commercial laboratory, as um, many others can, is really improving access to MPOX testing for those clinicians who may not liaise routinely with LRN laboratories or other public health laboratories. Um, so these folks have interfaces with us which allows for uh, simplification of the ordering process as well as results reporting. Um, and as well, we can provide access to supplies for testing as well as clear collection instructions. Um, not to say that the LRN laboratories um, can't do this, um, but certainly we have um, a, a, a slightly larger reach and, and folks are used to ordering from, uh, from commercial laboratories such as LabCorp. So one of the first things we did to address um, some bottlenecks that, that we thought um, were um, inhibiting the throughput of the MVO assay is um, really an improvement to the dry swab processing um, that um, was being done. Um, the, the, the assay was initially um, set up to elute one swab at a time in a Roche set, sets tube. Um, so we wanted to convert that to an elution into a 96 well plate. And then the second bottleneck that we addressed was extraction capacity. So um, we wanted to migrate extraction from the Kaigen platform to a MagnaPure platform. So that was our second update that, that we made. So we obviously could not just swap these things out without doing a validation. Um, and so that, that was where we started our NVO assay scaling um, journey. So um, for those of you who um, may not work with dry swabs um, all the time, I think many laboratories um, tend to get swabs um, that are already uh, in a media. Um, the, when we when we started getting involved with looking at the NVO assay, the initial preferred sample type was a dry swab of the lesion fluid, and there was a recommendation to submit two swabs. Um, and and there were some pros and cons with submitting um, dry swabs. Um, a pro, obviously, was the there was really. Um, all the material that you collected on the swab, you could elute into a small amount of liquid to do the extraction, um, which, which was great because that really increased the sen sen sensitivity of the test. Um, and as I said in the introductory slides, uh, the uh, MPOX is exceptionally stable. Um, so we knew that um, we could recover MPOX um, from a dry swab uh, for a prolonged period of time after it was taken. Um, 
there was a recommendation to collect two swabs from the same location um, in case something went wrong with the initial testing. Um, but some of the drawbacks are it's it may not be the same sample if you take two swabs from the same lesion. Um, dependent on how much material is picked up in the swab, they're not exactly 100% exact, the same swab. Um, and all of the sample is really consumed in the testing protocol. So if repeat testing is required and folks only submitted a single swab and we couldn't give a result, then they would have to collect another sample. So not really ideal. Um, and we also um, realized that in the original protocol, we were asked to elute material on dry swabs into a Roche tube, a SETS tube. Um, and these allowed for processing of a single sample at a time, um, which was not um, very, very quick to, to say the least. And at the beginning of the MPOX outbreak, the SETS tubes quickly went on back order. Um, so working with our R&D group, um, we were able to um, produce data to show th that we could elute dry swabs into a device called a Promega slick prep plate to process the specimens. And shown on the right is the slick prep plate um, where you put your swabs um, into a spin basket. Um, you have a U-shaped collar that goes between the spin basket and a 96 well uh, deep, deep well plate. And you can actually pipette material over top of those swabs um, to elute. So we were able to process 90 swabs at a time versus one swab at a time. And that's just highlighted here in this slide. Um, some of the drawbacks of this approach is that our swab tips needed to be cut for processing. Um, and we, we quickly took over biosafety uh, cat, cat, cabinets at LabCorp. We had teams of folks who were um, inserting swabs into these 96 well deep well plates. Um, cutting the, the swabs with scissors, which then had to be disinfected with bleach and ethanol between samples. Um, we also received swabs that were, um, in some cases, too large to fit into wells. Um, and these needed to be processed via sets tubes or rejected. And an initial protocol for adding PBS to a loop by PBS over the swabs was kind of cumbersome. So we actually validated placing dry swabs into a well and eluding into the bottom of the plate for 10 minutes to avoid pipetting over. And again, we did all this in BSL2 plus um, using N95s, disposable gowns, double gloves. So it was a very cumbersome procedure. But how did it work? Um, so it actually worked very well compared to the sets processing. Um, and you can see that we achieved the same LOD um, for the EZ1 as the MP96 or the MagnaPure 96. And the correlation, um, although not perfect for VAC1 between EZ1 and MP96, was still relatively good. Um, so we, we established a comparable uh, L LOD to the, to the method that was an originally approved method for the NVO. Now, what about PCR capacity? Um, so the 7500, we did have some of those instruments at LabCorp, and that's what we launched with. However, we had far more instruments of the QS7 Flex, um, and these were purchased to support COVID-19 testing. And staff were familiar with their use. Um, they allowed us to define lockdown protocols, and we were also concerned that this was really going to take off, and we wanted to move from a 96 well capacity to a larger capacity plate. But how did we make this conversion? We needed to show equivalence to the ABI performance. So we did that and we actually um, established um, really strong performance and correlation between the QS7 Flex and the 7500D DX for the detection of VAC1. And as shown in the table, we saw um, exactly the same LOD in a really tight uh, correlation between the CTs um, between the two instruments. So we were allowed to implement um, the slick prep, the MagnaPure, and the QS7 set, set Flex. Um, and these, this, these modifications were really supported by FDA letters that were sent to the C, C, CDC indicating enforcement 
bit discretion on the modifications that we made. And so here's an excerpt from the letter um, and it includes the, the, the modifications that I just previously described. Um, and, and the intent is that the data that we and others have generated um, for these modifications will be incorporated into um, the 510K um, for the NVO assay. So th this actually happened um, very quickly. Um, this letter that I have the excerpt um, pulled out of um, was actually issued on Ju July 4th. So people were working on the 4th of July um, in response to the MPOX outbreak. Um, the next bottleneck that we wanted to kind of overcome was um, that dry swab processing. We felt that that really held us back from being able to process um, a lot of specimens in a short period of time. Um, so our goal was to validate the use of universal transport or UTM. Um, so again, we needed to show equivalence to dry swabs um, and UTM. And we did this by um, contriving samples for vaccinia um, and then um, either uh, putting those swabs into the slick prep method for elution or placing them into negative clinical uh, UTM. And we did extractions. We again compared MagnaPure 96 and EZ1 and saw great correlation um, between um, the dry swabs and swabs placed in UTM. So we were able to offer both UTM and viral transport in late July, and this really helped us to um, remove another bottleneck in the NVO processing. So just to sort of look at this graph, I, I'm really, the, the, this is one of my favorite graphs that are actually published because it actually shows really well the commercial lab impacts on NPOX testing across the United States. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen, um, you can see the positivity rate is in orange um, for testing, but the blue bars um, actually show the number of specimens tested. And really, we launched on July 6th of 2022, and really we're ramping up and testing um, thousands of specimens on a weekly basis by the end of that month. And you can see that in the number of specimens tested um, through the summer um, and into the early fall of 2022. And so the, the graph on the right kind of correlates very nicely with what we see on the left. These are the lab core specific metrics through 2022. And as you can see, our, our test volume per week um, has that massive spike in July and then um, drops off to, to sort of where we are now um, with test volume. Um, but really it was the commercial laboratories that, that as they came on board really expanded that access to testing. And the, the map below is really a heat map of positivity rates. And it, this doesn't reflect the positivity rates of the outbreak throughout the United States. Um, but certainly represents the positivity rates of specimens that came through the LabCorp laboratories. Um, and uh, we saw, um, eventually we have seen testing come through all 50 states. Um, and I, and um, as, of, as of this date, most of the states we have detected positive cases from. So some of the challenges associated with high volume MPOX testing, um, I think early in the outbreak, it was really apparent that women and children were at low risk for MPOX infection. Um, and the, the graph on the right um, actually shows both the positivity rates for males and females with males being in orange and females being in, in gray. Um, but if you look at how many females and how many males are tested, um, certainly there is a large proportion of women being tested um, as part of this MPOX outbreak. Not that women can't get MPOX, um, certainly um, just that the epidemiology looked like it was mostly in males. And um, certainly um, we, we did see some pediatric cases um, of MPOX that were true positives, um, but 
um, anytime a, a child was tested and was positive, we were very skeptical of that result. Um, so in August, the CDC issued an advisory to provide guidance to laboratories to mitigate uh, potentially false po po positive results. Um, and they recommended to repeat testing from extraction to confirm high C CTs. And we had actually incorporated this, pro this process early in August um, in pediatric patients less than 14 years ago, or 14 years of age, um, si simply because um, the prevalence in, in those age groups were, were appearing to be quite low. Um, as I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, really interpretation of um, MPOX testing um, was a little bit tricky. Um, there are two categories, equivocal and inconclusive, that I fielded a number of calls on. And um, really, the, the result or the interpretation, um, while slightly different, um, what you would do next is, is very much the same. Um, so an equivocal result um, is kind of a gray zone result. So we detected VAC1 at a very late C, C, CT value. Um, we were able to reproduce that, um, but we knew patients with MPOX generally had very high loads um, in their lesions. So our recommendation for equivocal results was to repeat um, testing with a new specimen. And um, similarly, inconclusive was really a reflection of uh, the inability to detect the RNA's P gene as a measure of uh, internal control. Um, and so these were reported as inconclusive. And again, if a diagnosis had not been determined, our recommendation was to submit a new specimen. And so we put this on our reports as interpretive comments. Um, and we also put up some information on our MPOX microsite um, to try to explain what the differences were with these two reports. And then, and then finally, um, another challenge is that people were correctly going to the C CDC website um, to get the latest guidance on MPOX. And um, they had uh, posted guidelines for collecting specimens for MPOX testing. Um, but people didn't necessarily um, read what I have underlined here that um, they should contact the appropriate lab that they're sending their specimens to to determine what specimen types um, those laboratories would accept. Um, and so we differed um, a little bit from the CDC in that um, we accept dry swabs and VTM, um, but we also validated UTM as an alternate collection device. Um, and in fact, most, most of our specimens do come in that way. Um, and in addition, uh, we don't accept non-swab specimens, so lesion crusts or exudates, um, which are uh, specimen types that are acceptable at other laboratories. So. It's important to go to the laboratory test menu of the lab you're, you're using to ensure you're following their specimen requirements. So I'll just finish with the current state of MPOX testing um, in the US. Um, the commercial laboratories that brought these tests on in uh, the summer of um, 2022 continue to respond. Um, we have seen in 2023 a, a slight uptick in testing and positivity rate um, certainly nowhere near the July 2022 numbers that we saw. Um, we, can, we can and we continue to generate and share data on how the laboratory tests are performing, um, both from a demographics of test population um, perspective, um, co-infection rates. Um, we do have some work that we've done uh, for HIV, chlamydia, GC, syphilis, as well as other STIs. And, and also um, really understanding patients that fail to clear an infection. Why do they fail to clear? Are they potentially resistant to TPOX? Um, really just um, have the ability to, to just generate um, a lot of data in a very short period of time to rapidly understand um, what's going on. Um, 
we've also seen that as part of the MPOX outbreak, there's a greater desire to test for other infections that are present with lesions, such as BZV and herpes and syphilis. And, um, you know, we've established private public partnerships um, first with COVID and now with MPOX. And I think we're ready to respond to whatever is next. So with that, just a quick acknowledgement, a lot of folks on the LabCorp team um, that helped on the R&D and the verifications as well as staff in my laboratory is performing testing. And then our external partners um, shown on the right there who um, certainly were very um, helpful and forthright with information. So with thank that- you so, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Dale. This has been really uh, just insightful and just this tremendous activity you and your team have done on this. We have only about five, five minutes for some quick questions. We do have some in the chat. Um, I think Rodney's going to go through those. So if we could get these answered relatively quickly, um, hopefully we can get to them all. Nope, oh, Rodney's on mute. Yeah, I got it. One okay. of the questions, thank you. One of the questions, Dr. Dell, is uh, from Toronto, and they want you to expound a little bit more on the collaboration between LabCorp, CDC, and the FDA with respect to how that kind of helped facilitate a rapid increase in testing capacity and access. Sure. I mean that that was um, very much a lot of a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of sharing of protocols. Um, anytime we had a question or required some interpretation, um, we had appropriate contacts to be able to reach out to and get those answered very quickly. So it's it's really communication one hundred and one. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I mean, it, I've got. I've been working in public health for over 31 years. And I think what's so important, I know you would agree, is that outside of our world, a lot of people don't realize the critical importance of that LRN network uh, as it ties into not just other public health labs, but into hospitals and healthcare so that people can rapidly access that. And I think that's the one of the biggest lessons uh, post COVID and now MPOX is that we continue that. There was also a question about if you could speak to maybe a little bit about getting into the weeds a little bit about the transport conditions of the dry swabs mm -hmm. and kind of the sample integrity piece. Yeah, so um, it's 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 funny. Um, it, so the 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 transport I when we first started I think was um, seven days refrigerated and then frozen for up to thirty days. Um, but our experience, and we, we, we have some data to support this, is that we could go back to swabs that were sitting on the bench at room temperature, either dry or wet, um, a month to 40 days after the fact, and still recover um, the DNA. And we lost maybe one to two CT values. Um, so, so we think it's, it's extremely stable. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, we learned from COVID that we've always taken care of viruses with, with kid gloves, so to speak. Um, but these things might be a little bit more stable than maybe where we necessarily recognize for, for diagnosing infections where there's a high burden of virus in the specimen. Great, great, great. One other quick question, perhaps uh, someone would like you to address maybe about the PPE specifically yeah. uh, in your work with this particular virus. Yes, yeah, so, so we were super conservative um, just because we hadn't worked with it previously. Um, so we followed the enhanced uh, B BSL-2 precautions. Um, so we had folks fit tested for an N95, even though they were working in the BSC. Um, we, we did have to transport that plate, the slick plate, um, you know, through throughout the lab. So wanted to make sure that people had the respiratory protection, um, double gloves, disposable lab coat, and and we worked in teams. So it was a very much a team setting to sort of cut swabs and um, make sure everything was disinfected. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Dale, for uh, addressing all of these questions and for your excellent presentation. I want to remind everyone that this One Lab initiative is a CDC led effort to bridge, train, and sustain a capacity building community, which is the One Lab network.
among public health and medical laboratory professionals to support rapid large scale responses to public health emergencies. This effort includes, includes developing a learning management system for lab professionals and pathologists, which is called the One Lab Reach. One Lab Reach also provides the ability to opt in for access to an educational hub of training resources for uh, professionals and volunteers performing CLIA waived point of care diagnostic testing in non-laboratory non settings. And this is called One Lab Test. Yeah, and I would also like to thank you, Dr. Dell, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, it's always it's always a pleasure for me to hear kind of this collaborative effort across public health, pathology, the medical laboratory. Uh, we we know we're all one big family, but I think the pandemic and monkeypox really really brought that back home for us again. So I really want to thank you for that. Uh, finally, we want to encourage all attendees to continue engaging with the laboratory peers and staying up to date with cutting edge laboratory trainings by joining the One Lab Network. And you can see that on your slide and signing up for access to CDC One Lab Reach with the QR code link and CD, which is CDC's new LMS for laboratory training materials. So some great materials for laboratory. Uh, you can stay up to date with ASCP's work supporting the One Lab initiative and several new resources in our pipeline, including past and future Building Bridges resources and registration details on our website. And I also want to uh, mention that this is our final session for series one. Uh, ASCP and CDC will plan to hopefully continue in the future uh, with series two. So keep your eyes open for that. And if you have any topics that you might be interested in suggesting, you can do that in the evaluation with the follow-up survey. So I know Dr. Brown and I and the entire team are so excited about this first series and we thank all of you and we look forward to the future with you. Thank you all.